Performance counts isn't just a slogan at Mack Trucks, and our newest six-cylinder engine, the 12-liter E7, proves it yet again. The E7 has been thoroughly durability tested and provides Mack customers with an unequaled combination of power, quality, and dependability. This two-part video covers the overhaul procedures for the E7 engine. In particular, it details the inspections and adjustments that are critical to performing a sound and lasting overhaul. But first, let's discuss the major things that make the E7 unique. The E7 is based on and resembles the E6 engine, but it differs in many ways. For instance, the E7 has a larger displacement than the E6, 12 liters versus 11. Despite this, the E7 actually weighs 16 pounds less when filled with coolant and oil. The E7 gains larger displacement, greater power, and lower weight through increased stroke and the use of a new cylinder block with wet-dry cylinder sleeves. As shown in blue on this cutaway E7, this arrangement allows a more efficient coolant passage design with the result that the E7 needs less coolant, a full 12 and a half quarts less. The coolant passages in E7 cylinder heads were also redesigned for improved efficiency. That means you can't swap E6 and E7 heads. And while we're on that subject, don't assume that you can swap any other E6 and E7 parts. Finally, a close-coupled Bosch P-Series injection pump is used exclusively on the E7. And all metric fasteners tie the parts of this advanced power plant together. We'll begin our overhaul with the build-up of this bare E7 block. We'll assume that you've followed the recommended procedures to remove, disassemble, and clean the engine. Be sure to refer to the appropriate Mac service publications if you need help getting the engine to this point. Here are a few important notes to keep in mind during disassembly. Be sure to remove the injector fuel inlet tubes and lines before attempting to remove the nozzle holders. Cap all electrical connectors and pump delivery valves to prevent dirt or corrosion from damaging parts. And be sure to plug the bolt hole in the crank before pulling the vibration damper hub. This will keep the puller from damaging the bolt threads. Use extreme care when removing the timing gear cover so that you do not damage the timing indicator. Note the positions of all parts with matching wear surfaces so they can be reinstalled in their original locations. Some of these parts include the push rods, valve yokes, and valve lifters. After disassembly, clean all parts and thoroughly inspect them for cracks, obstructions, worn gasket surfaces, excessive wear, or other damage. This includes all nuts, bolts, and washers as well. Repair or replace any damaged parts. At a major overhaul, in addition to installing all new gaskets and seals, Mac recommends replacing a number of other parts. These include all the bushings and bearings used in the engine, along with the cylinder sleeves, pistons, piston rings, block and head core plugs, and all the connecting rod bolts. During assembly, to assure leak-free gaskets, degrease both gasket sealing surfaces before installing a gasket. Also, be sure to use only the recommended lubricants and sealing compounds. For example, a particular type of sealant should be used to seal cup plugs and some threaded plugs. To hold metal parts in place, use only petroleum jelly or another lubricant that contains no additives. To lubricate engine parts, use engine oil. And unless otherwise specified, before installing a fastener, lightly coat its threads and the underside of its head 
or both sides of its washer with engine oil. This will allow you to tighten the nut or bolt to the proper torque. The specifications, special tools, and recommended lubricants for the procedures shown in this videotape are covered in the E7 engine manual. Take a break now to review what we've covered so far. Now let's begin this overhaul by checking the block. After the block is cleaned and tested for cracks and leaks, check its deck surface for warpage and fretting wear. If warpage or fretting wear exceeds specs, have the block deck resurfaced. Inspect the cylinder block sleeve seats. If any of them are damaged or pitted, they must be recut. In addition, if the block is resurfaced, the sleeve seats must also be recut to the proper depth. Next, check the cylinder bores for out of round and taper. On the E7, you have to check the lower dry portion and the upper wet portion of the bore. Inspect the lower part of the bore as you would any other dry liner bore. Take two readings at 90 degree angles in these places, just below the sleeve seat, at the bottom of the bore, and midway between the two. You only need to check for the proper diameter and out of round in the upper portion of the bore where the sleeve contacts the block. If any bore is excessively tapered or out of round, it should be machined to accept an oversized sleeve. Now inspect and measure the valve lifter bores and the camshaft. and auxiliary shaft bushing bores for proper finish and size. To assure proper block to bushing contact and heat transfer, degrease the block bushing bores and mark the block with the locations of the oil holes. Also, degrease the backs of the cam bushings Install them using the appropriate drivers, starting with the rear one and working your way to the front. During installation, use the mark on the block as a guide to align the bushing oil hole. Drive each bushing in until its oil hole is centered on the oil hole in the bushing bore. Install the auxiliary shaft bushings in the same way. Just make sure to position the rear bushing in its bore so the slot and groove in the bushing are closer to the rear of the engine. Do the opposite for the front bushing. Position it so the slot and groove in the bushing are closer to the front of the engine. Measure the depth of each cylinder sleeve seat. If one exceeds specifications, recut the seat to increase or install shims to decrease the depth. Place the lower cylinder sleeve seal in its groove in the cylinder bore. Lightly lubricate the seal with MAC O-ring lubricant. Install the crevice seal on the cylinder sleeve. Lubricate this with ethylene glycol type engine coolant. Next, put a 160 thousandths inch thick bead of the proper Celastic on the cylinder block sleeve seat. Push the sleeve into the bore as far as it will go. To completely seat it, hammer it down as shown using a large soft-faced mallet. <laughs> 
Install all the other cylinder sleeves in the same way and use hold down bolts and washers to secure the sleeves in the block. Measure the sleeve channel heights to be sure they are within specifications. Measure at four places, 90 degrees apart, and compare the average of these readings with specifications. If one sleeve is out of limits, remove it and check for a rolled seal or dirt or other debris on the cylinder block sleeve seat. Also check that the sleeve channel heights for one cylinder head do not vary more than allowed. If they do, add shims or recut the sleeve seats as necessary. Take a break here to review. The piston cooling nozzles are next. Slide new seals onto the cooling nozzle locating tubes and lubricate the seals with engine oil. Then install the tubes in the block. As on all Mac engines, the location of the oil spray is essential to cooling the piston. So turn the engine upright and check the spray location of each nozzle using the special tools. If the rod is less than one eighth inch or three millimeters out of the target area, bend the nozzle slightly at its hooked end until the rod is in the target. On the other hand, if the rod is more than one eighth inch or three millimeters out of the target area, replace the nozzle. Lubricate and install the valve lifters in their original bores. Now, inspect the crankshaft gear and examine the crankshaft journals for excessive wear, damage, out of round, or taper. Have the crank magnaflux to check for cracks. If the crank or gear must be replaced, you'll have to pull the gear off the crankshaft. To install the gear, first tap a new crank key into position. Then heat the crankshaft gear to approximately 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees Celsius. With the timing mark facing out and the gear aligned with the key, push the gear quickly into position on the crankshaft. It should bottom out on the crank. If it doesn't, drive it onto the crank until it seats. Next, Thoroughly clean and degrease the main bearing surfaces in the block and the backs of the bearing inserts. Then press the upper bearing halves into position in the block. The upper and lower bearing halves are different. The upper halves have oil holes while the lower bearing halves are solid. Put new standard thickness thrust washers in place at the center main bearing. And lightly lubricate the bearing halves and thrust washers with engine oil. Carefully lower the crankshaft onto the bearings. Also clean and degrease the bearing surfaces in the main caps and the backs of the lower bearing halves before installation. Install standard thrust washers on the center main bearing cap. Then lubricate the bearings before putting the caps in their proper positions on the block. Fully seat the bearing caps by tapping them with a plastic faced hammer. Then tighten the main bearing cap bolts to specification. Next, set up a dial indicator to measure crankshaft end play. If it's out of specification, install different size thrust washers. Once end play is within specs, check the main bearing oil clearances with plastic gauge. With the engine upside down, remove all the main caps and install a strip of plastic gauge material on each main journal. Then reinstall all the caps, including the center main bearing cap with its proper thrust washers and torque them to specifications. Remove the main caps and measure the clearance on each journal. 
If clearance on a journal is out of tolerance, make sure you're using the correct bearings and that they are seated properly with no particles behind the bearing halves. One note here, if you check the main bearing oil clearances with the engine upright, as in an in-frame overhaul, you must support the crank in order to get an accurate reading. When the main bearing clearances are correct, remove the plastic gauge material from the bearing and journal surfaces. Lubricate the journals and thrust washers and install and seat the main caps in the block. Lubricate and loosely install the buttress screws. Then torque all the main bearing caps to specs, followed by all the buttress screws. The crankshaft installation is now complete. Take a break now to review what we've just covered. Next up, the camshaft. Inspect the camshaft thrust washer for excessive wear and the cam and injection pump drive gears for damaged teeth. Check the camshaft for excessive runout and worn or damaged lobes or journals. Also, have the cam magnafluxed to check for cracks. If none of these parts needs to be replaced, the entire camshaft assembly can be reinstalled in the block. Lubricate the camshaft journals and lobes and slide the assembly into the block, being careful to avoid nicking or scratching the camshaft bushings. Properly align the cam and crank gear timing marks. Then install the camshaft thrust washer bolts. If the cam, thrust washer or one of the gears in the assembly must be replaced, you'll have to break down the camshaft assembly by pressing the gears off the camshaft. To reassemble the gears, install a new cam gear key in the shaft and slide the camshaft thrust washer into position. Heat the cam and injection pump drive gears to approximately 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 177 degrees Celsius. Apply the proper locking compound to the camshaft. Quickly slide the gear onto the shaft, positioning it so it's aligned with the key in the cam. If the gear doesn't bottom on the cam, press it onto the shaft until it seats. Install the injection pump drive gear in the same way. There's no key or special alignment for this gear. Next, inspect the auxiliary shaft journals and gears. Replace the shaft if it is damaged or excessively worn. To install it, lubricate the shaft journals with engine oil and slide the shaft into the block. Install the captured thrust washer and the auxiliary shaft drive gear. And tighten the drive shaft nut. Measure the end play of the camshaft and auxiliary shaft. If either end play is out of specifications, replace the respective thrust washer with a new one. Also measure the backlash of the camshaft to crankshaft gear and the auxiliary shaft to camshaft gear. Make sure the engine is upright when you make these checks. If either of these backlash readings doesn't meet specifications, Replace the appropriate gears. The timing covers next. Before installing it, check the condition of the timing covered dowels. If they appear to be damaged or worn, they should be removed and replaced. If the dowels are okay, check the alignment of the diamond dowel and adjust it if necessary. Then apply a thin coat of silastic on the block mating surface and install the timing cover and the pedestal mount. 
Install the timing cover seal using the proper special tool. The flywheel housing is installed in the same way as the timing cover. Again, check the condition of the dowels and the alignment of the diamond dowel. Inspect the crankshaft flange for any surface damage that might cause the rear crank seal to fail. Polish the flange if necessary. Then apply a thin coat of silastic on the block surface and install the flywheel housing. Lubricate the rear crank seal with engine oil and install it using the proper special tool. Set the tool to the correct seal installation depth before pushing the seal into position. Take a break now for review. Now, inspect the connecting rods. With the rod bolts torqued to specs, check the crank pin bore and piston pin bushing diameters. If either of these is out of specification, recondition or replace the connecting rod. If necessary, remove the piston pin bushing by pressing it out using the specified tools. To install one, position the rod in the tool with the rod oil hole to the right hand side. Then place the bushing on the rod so the oil holes line up. Locate the installer on the bushing and press the bushing into place. Next, fully expand the bushing in the rod using the piston pin burnishing brooch. When the broaching operation is complete, have the pin bushing machine to the proper size and surface finish. Have all the rods checked for cracks, proper center to center length, excessive bend and twist. Replace any that are damaged or worn beyond specifications. When replacing a rod, be sure to obtain an equivalent service part. It's best to get a service rod with the same M number as the original rod. The M number is a weight classification. If the same M number isn't available, you can only use a rod that isn't more than one M number higher or lower than any of the other connecting rods in the engine. For example, if the engine has an M1 rod in it, only an M1 or M2 rod can be used as a replacement. An M3 rod can't be used because it's two weight classes heavier than an M1 rod. After checking the rods, measure the piston ring end gaps. If any are out of specification, do not file the rings to obtain the proper gap. Instead, install the ring on another piston in a bore where the gap is okay, or use a new ring. Install the piston rings using the correct expander. Make sure the ID markings on the rings face toward the top of the piston. Stagger the ring gaps as shown. Install a piston pin snap ring in the piston. The sharp edged side of the ring faces outward. Properly position the connecting rod in the piston so that the front mark on the rod faces the front mark on the crown of the piston. Lubricate the piston pin with engine oil and push it into place through the piston and small end of the connecting rod. Install the other snap ring. Assemble all other connecting rods and single piece pistons in the same way. <laughs> 
Some E7 engines use two-piece pistons. Installing these is similar to the process for single-piece pistons, with a few exceptions. Since these pistons have only three rings, stagger them like this. To assemble the piston on the rod, first install one of the pin snap rings. Then put the piston skirt and rod into position and slide the piston pin into place. Install the other snap ring to complete the assembly. To install a piston and rod assembly, whether it has a one or two piece piston, first thoroughly clean and degrease the rod and cap bearing surfaces and the backs of the rod bearings. Then press the proper upper bearing half into the rod. This bearing is marked upper on the back and has an oil hole. Then install the lower bearing half in the cap. This bearing is stamped lower and does not have an oil hole. Lubricate the piston rings and install the piston and rod assembly in a piston ring compressor. Lubricate the upper rod bearing half and the cylinder sleeve with engine oil. Turn the crankshaft until the crank pin for the piston you want to install is at bottom dead center. Locate the piston assembly in the bore with the front mark on the rod toward the front of the engine. Then push the piston and rod assembly into the cylinder bore. Be sure the big end of the rod does not bend the piston cooling nozzle. Lubricate the lower connecting rod cap bearing and install the cap. Hand tighten the cap screws. Install all the other piston and connecting rod assemblies in the same way. Now, check the connecting rod bearing oil clearances with plastic gauge. To obtain a good reading, the engine should be upright and the upper connecting rod bearing should be fully seated on the crank pins. Correct any oil clearance problems. Then remove the plastic gauge material. Lubricate the lower cap bearings and loosely install the caps using new bolts. Before torquing the cap bolts, align each cap to its rod by inserting two equal width thickness gauges at the parting lines. Then tap the cap toward the gauges until the cap and rod are flush at both parting lines. Check that the crank rotates after tightening each cap to specs. If it doesn't, a side or oil clearance problem exists on the last cap you torqued. Now check the piston to block deck height. If the block was resurfaced or some connecting rods were reconditioned or replaced. If this height exceeds specifications on any piston, make sure that you've installed the correct pistons and that the minimum block deck height is within specification. With all the caps installed, tap each rod to one side and check the amount of side clearance between the rod and crank. If clearance does not meet specifications, recheck the cap to rod alignment. That's it for part one of the E7 engine overhaul. Part two picks up with oil pump inspection. Take a moment here to review these important points.
In part one, we covered about half of the procedures needed to overhaul an E7 engine. Here in part two, we'll complete the process, beginning with the inspection of the oil pump. Look for nicks or scores on the pump gears, housing, and pump cover. In particular, look for damage to the relief valve seat and bushings in the housing. Replace the pump if you find any damage. With the pump gears in the housing, check the gear end clearance, side clearance, and backlash. If any of these measurements is out of specification, replace the oil pump. Check the pump screen for damage or blockage. Clean or replace the pickup tube and screen. Reassemble the pump. Then lubricate and install a new relief valve plunger and spring. Finally, assemble the pump on the engine. Now install the oil pan on the block using a new pan gasket. Before moving on to the cylinder heads, heat the crankshaft hub to approximately 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees Celsius. Then install a new hub key in the nose of the crank. When the hub is hot enough, slide it quickly onto the crank until it bottoms. Slide the hub washer into place. Then install and torque the retaining bolt. Assemble the vibration damper, crank pulley, and turnover bracket on the hub. Like the block, the cylinder heads should be disassembled, cleaned, inspected for cracks, and pressure tested for leaks. Check and assemble the heads in the following way. Check the cylinder head deck surface for warpage and fretting wear. If warpage or fretting wear exceed specifications, the heads must be resurfaced. If the heads have been resurfaced, Measure their heights to be sure they are within the minimum service height specification. If not, replace the heads. Resurfaced heads must have new fire ring grooves cut in them. Use the special tools to cut new grooves in the head. Remove all the valve seat inserts by grinding a groove in each insert and pulling it out using the proper special tools. Then, have the counter bores machined to accept oversized valve seat inserts. Install new inserts by driving them in using the appropriate installer. The insert can then be ground to the proper seat angle. Remove all the valve guides by pressing them out with the proper removing tool. To install new ones, first lightly lubricate them. Then press them into the head using the proper installer. A guide is properly installed when its height above the spring seat meets specifications. Ream the valve guide to the proper dimension and check the concentricity of the guide to the insert. Take a break here to review what we've covered so far. Loose or leaking injection nozzle holders, as shown on this cutaway, must be removed and replaced. To remove a holder, tap its inside diameter with a 3 quarter 10 tap. Then install the holder puller attachment on a slide hammer and thread the assembly into the holder. Use the slide hammer to pull the holder out of the head. Be sure to clean the nozzle area thoroughly after the holder has been removed. To install a holder, apply Loctite to these three areas of the holder. Then drive it into the head using the proper installer. Excessively worn valve yoke guide pins must also be replaced. 
remove them using the proper extractor tools, and install them using the proper driver. Install any of the core plugs that were removed. Apply some sealant to the pipe plugs before installing and torquing them. These plugs must not extend beyond the machine surface of the head. Carefully inspect the intake and exhaust valves for straightness and excessive wear. Replace any bent or excessively worn valves. Measure the valve stem diameter. If out of specification, replace the valve. Regrind all the valves to the proper angle. If grinding causes the valve margin width to fall below specs on any valve, replace it. Check the valve to seat contact using Prussian blue. Apply the marking compound to the face of the valve at four points, each 90 degrees apart. Install the valve in its seat and rotate it no more than one quarter turn. If the seat insert shows a full contact pattern, the valve and seat will seal properly. With the valves in place in the head, check the protrusion of the inlet valves and the depth of the exhaust valves. If the dimension on a valve doesn't meet specs, regrind the valve or seat or replace the valve. Inspect the valve springs for cracks, roughness, or grooving, particularly on the inside surfaces of the coils. Also check the spring force and length on the proper tester. If the force or length is not to specification, or any spring is cracked, rough, or grooved, replace the faulty valve spring. Lubricate the valve stems and install the valves in their original locations. Intake valves have one stem groove, while exhaust valves have two. Complete the installation of each valve as follows. Place the valve rotator on the spring seat in the head. Then put the spring and the spring cap in place. Compress the spring and install the locks. Place new cylinder head gaskets on the engine block deck and install the fire rings. Make sure the side of the gasket marked top faces up. Place the cylinder heads on the engine and loosely install the head bolts in the correct positions. Use a straight edge against the exhaust mounting surfaces to align the heads. Then torque the bolts in three stages following the proper sequence. Take a break here to review. Lubricate both ends of the push rods with engine oil and install them in their original positions in the block. Make sure the rods seat in the valve lifter sockets. Also lubricate the valve yoke guide pins and install the yokes in their original positions. If any rocker shaft parts require replacement, begin disassembling the shafts by removing the outer rocker arms. Then unbolt the bracket locating screw and press the brackets off the shaft as necessary. Reassemble these parts by reversing the disassembly procedure. Be sure to properly locate the brackets on the shaft so they will align with the threaded holes in the cylinder head. On Dynatard equipped engines, place a new solenoid O-ring in the rocker shaft counterbore. Then lubricate the solenoid mounting threads with engine oil and install the solenoid. Make sure the rocker adjusting screws and lash adjusters, if any, are retracted 
This will prevent bending of push rod during rocker shaft installation. Install the rocker shafts in their original positions in the heads. On Dynatard engines, screw the electrical terminals into the cylinder head bolts. And install the harness pass-through wires. If necessary, turn the solenoid by hand to orient its wire toward the electrical terminal. Do not use a wrench or other tool to turn the solenoid. Install the solenoid and pass-through wires on the terminal. Proper valve lash adjustment and injection pump timing are, of course, critical. The accuracy of the timing indicator used to adjust the valves and time the pump is therefore also critical. So before adjusting the valves or timing the pump, always check the accuracy of the timing indicator. To do this with the heads on the engine, first install a top dead center indicator in the number one cylinder injector holder. If you're doing this check with the engine installed, tie the injection pump stop lever in the stop position to prevent the engine from starting. Turn the crankshaft until the number one cylinder is at approximately top dead center. Zero the dial indicator. And put a length of masking tape on the vibration damper. Center the tape under the pump indicator pointer. Next, turn the crankshaft counterclockwise until the dial indicator needle makes two complete turns. Then reverse direction and stop when the needle indicates 50 thousandths or 1.3 millimeters before top dead center, TDC. Note on this indicator, each complete revolution of the needle equals 50 thousandths inches. Mark the exact position of the pump timing indicator on the tape. Continue to rotate the crankshaft clockwise past top dead center and stop when the needle indicates 50 thousandths after TDC. Again, mark the exact position of the pump timing indicator on the tape. Now, find the exact center between the two marks on the tape. An easy way to do this is to cut a strip of paper to fit exactly between the two marks and then fold it in half. Use the folded paper as a guide to mark the exact midpoint between the other two marks. This middle mark is the exact TDC position for the crankshaft. Rotate the crankshaft counterclockwise past the middle TDC mark. Then turn the crank clockwise to align the pump pointer with the TDC mark on the tape. Remove the tape from the damper and if necessary, bend or adjust the position of the pump pointer to line up with the number one and six TDC mark on the damper. The timing indicator now accurately indicates TDC and can be used to adjust the valves and time the pump. Note that this procedure for checking the accuracy of the pointer could also have been made before the heads were installed. If you did the check at that time, you wouldn't need the TDC indicator. Instead, use a dial indicator to contact the top of the piston directly. Take a break here to review. To adjust the valves, rotate the crankshaft clockwise until the valve pointer aligns with the number one and six TDC mark. In this position, you don't know whether cylinder one or cylinder six is firing. We want to start adjusting the valves on the number one cylinder, so it has to be in firing position. To make sure the number one cylinder is on the right stroke, Temporarily take all the lash out of the number one and number six intake valve rockers. Then watch the number six intake rocker as you rotate the crank clockwise.
If this rocker begins to open the intake valves, the number one cylinder is firing. Turn the crankshaft counterclockwise past where the valve pointer aligns with the 1 and 6 TDC mark. Then turn it clockwise again to align the valve pointer with the mark. Begin adjusting the valves with the number one cylinder. If, as you rotated the crank, the number one intake rocker began to open its intake valves, the number six cylinder is firing. To bring up number one, rotate the crankshaft clockwise one revolution and align the valve pointer with the one six TDC mark on the damper. Next, make sure there is clearance between the rocker tip and the yoke. Then loosen the yoke adjusting lock nut and screw. Press down firmly on the yoke and turn the adjusting screw until it solidly contacts the valve stem. Line up a point of the lock nut with the slot in the adjusting screw and turn the screw clockwise until the slot aligns with the next point on the nut. This is equivalent to an extra one-sixth turn. Hold the adjusting screw in this position and tighten the lock nut. The yoke is now adjusted. To check that the adjustment is correct, insert two equal width thickness gauges between the valve stems and yoke. Apply moderate pressure to the yoke by slightly tightening the rocker screw. Check the drag on each gauge. A properly adjusted yoke should cause equal drag on both gauges. Adjust the valve lash by placing the specified thickness gauge between the rocker tip and yoke. Then, while pressing down on the rocker adjusting screw, turn it until you feel drag on the thickness gauge. Hold the screw in this position and tighten the lock nut. Use the same procedure to adjust the valve lash on rockers equipped with Dynatard lash adjusters. Just use the special lash adjuster tool to turn the lock nut and adjuster. Be sure to apply pressure to the adjuster when setting the valve lash. To complete the adjustment of the other valves, rotate the crankshaft clockwise 120 degrees to align the valve pointer with the next TDC mark on the damper. This will be the 5-2 mark. Adjust the valves on the next cylinder in the firing order. That's number 5. Continue this process of rotating the crankshaft 120 degrees and adjusting the valves of the next cylinder in the firing order until you've set the lash of all the valves. After all the valve lash adjustments have been made, Install the fuel return crossover line and, if removed, the fuel return fitting in the front head and the Allen head plug in the rear head. Take a break now to review what we've just covered. Now for the injection pump. The pump we'll be installing is for an engine without the VMAX system. And although the procedures are similar, the specific installation of a pump on a VMAX equipped E7 will be covered in another program. If the pump drive hub was removed, clean and degrease the tapered surfaces on the pump cam and the drive hub. Place the drive hub in the proper alignment fixture and slide the pump into place on the fixture so that it engages the alignment pins. Install the washer and drive hub nut and torque the nut to specifications. The pump drive hub is now properly aligned for pump installation. Do not rotate the hub until after the pump has been installed. Remove the pump from the fixture. Install a new pump O-ring Lubricate the O-ring and the injection pump mounting bore in the block. Slide the injection pump into place on the engine. Be careful not to damage the O-ring. Torque the pump mounting bolts to specification. Now, the pump must be timed to the engine. To do this, 
remove this plug at the rear of the pump. Then screw the fixed timing probe of the special position tool into the hole. The hole is notched so the probe will only go in one way. Connect the tool's ground clamp to a good ground and turn the tool on. Now rotate the pump camshaft clockwise until the A lamp on the tool lights. If the B lamp lights first, you're turning the cam in the wrong direction. Continue to rotate the pump camshaft clockwise until the B lamp also lights. When both lamps are lit, the pump is ready to be timed to the crankshaft. Rotate the crankshaft until the number one cylinder is on its compression stroke. Turn the crank counterclockwise past the pump timing specification on the damper. Then clockwise to align the pump pointer with the proper timing mark. Align the bolt holes in the pump driven gear with the holes in the pump hub and slide the gear into position. Install the pump driven gear bolts. Be careful not to drop them into the front cover. Check the pump to engine timing by rotating the crankshaft counterclockwise at least 45 degrees. Then turn the crankshaft clockwise until the A and B lamps light. The pump timing pointer should indicate the correct before TDC specification for the pump. If it doesn't, set the pump to engine timing again. Install a new O-ring on the pump driven gear cover and lubricate it. Then install the cover. Now install each injection nozzle in this way. Place new nozzle gaskets of the correct material in the nozzle holders. Make sure these gaskets lie flat in the holders. Then install new O-rings on the nozzle and thread it into the installation tool. Lubricate the O-rings with clean engine oil. Align the ball in the nozzle with the cutout in the holder bore and push the nozzle into position. Seat the nozzle by tapping down on the installation tool. Check the seating of the nozzle by placing the gauge block in the nozzle bore. The nozzle is properly seated when the top of the gauge block is flush with the head surface. If the block is below the head surface, the nozzle gasket may have been left out. If it's above the surface, too many gaskets may have been installed or the nozzle may not be fully seated. Install the nozzle clamping screws when you're sure the nozzles are seated properly. Place new seals in the rocker covers and install the covers on the engine. Also install the breather tube. Take a break now for review. At this point, all that remains to complete the overhaul is the installation of external engine components. So the rest of this overhaul shouldn't pose much difficulty for you. However, to keep you from getting into trouble, here are some highlights of the more important final assembly steps. First, the exhaust manifold. Unlike most other fasteners, the exhaust manifold nuts should not be lubricated before installation. Next, on most applications, install the oil feed tube in the auxiliary drive shaft before sliding the air compressor into place. And before installing the fuel lines, lubricate the threads on the nozzle fuel inlet tubes. Then torque the inlet tube nut first, followed by the sleeve nut. Do not turn both nuts at once or torque only the sleeve nut. This will not provide sufficient clamping of the inlet tube to the nozzle and may result in fuel leaks or damage to the inlet tubes. Next, torque all the fuel line nuts at the injection pump 
followed by the insulator clamp nuts. Inspect the relief valve bore and repair or replace the housing if the valve bore is damaged. Install a new valve and spring in the housing. Also, pressure test the oil cooler bundle and housing before installation. Finally, install any lines or wires that were originally removed from the engine. These include any Dynatard wiring, turbocharger lines, coolant conditioner lines, and other oil or fuel hoses or accessories. Once the wiring, hoses, and lines are installed, the overhaul is complete. Before starting the engine, however, a number of vital steps remain. A new coolant conditioner and oil and fuel filters must be installed. Then the engine must be filled with oil and coolant. Oil and fuel filters should be installed primed. With fuel filters, be sure to prime them by pouring the fuel into the filter material, not simply into the hollow center core of the filter. And before initial startup, the turbocharger should be primed with engine oil and the engine itself pre-lubed by cranking it with the injection pump stop lever pulled back until oil pressure builds up. Now the engine is ready to be started and broken in. One important caution here though, do not break in the engine by idling it for an extended period. This will cause excessive and unnecessary wear of parts. Instead, initially run the engine on a dynamometer or under normal loads to properly break it in. And once your overhauled E7 is back in operation, don't forget to retorque the cylinder heads and adjust the valves at the recommended time and begin the proper maintenance of the engine based on typical operating conditions. Careful and expert workmanship is required to overhaul an E7 engine properly. If you make your performance of the rebuild procedures count, an overhauled E7 will last as long as a new one. Take a moment here to review these important points from the final part of this tape.